Hey folks, Bill Gallier here for a Monster Train video. Instead of doing a run today, I wanted to address a problem that I've been seeing a lot on Reddit. Um, I've been seeing a lot of posts where people feel like Seraph the Patient is too strong, and that there's nothing that they can do in the fight, and I want to address that because I don't actually think the Seraph the Patient fight is all that hard once you understand it. I think it's very easy to lose to Seraph the Patient when you don't really know what's going on and you don't understand the fight, but as long as you're preparing for the fight literally from circle one and you're focusing your picks on making sure that you can win, I don't think this fight should be giving people as much trouble as it is. So let's start by looking at why I say that. So in this fight, the first two waves are incredibly easy. There's one shade wing in wave one and two shade wings in wave two. Now what does that mean? That means a crappy starter deck could beat this easily. Frozen Lance. Frozen Lance, Frozen Lance. You've made it through the first three waves of the final boss without taking all that much damage. Congratulations. Let's compare this to the other fights, where you are dealing with 140 or 190 HP from turn one. In the Seraph the Patient fight, you end up having more time to set up than normal. And that's important. It's not until wave three that you're actually asked to deal 190 damage. So you get some setup time, you get some breathing room, but you have to deal with the melee weakness and the large hits that can happen in this fight. That's what makes this last fight tricky. And if you can deal with that melee weakness, and to a lesser extent, Seraph scaling, this fight isn't actually all that bad. Every faction has ways that they can deal with this last fight. Hellhorn is probably the weakest of the five clans in dealing with this boss, but every other clan has pretty good options for dealing with it. Let's start with the two pieces of general advice, though. Number one is that Endless is absurd against this boss. If you have an Endless tank, it can just keep dying to melee weakness, and it's not that big of a deal as long as your DPS units can kill the backliners and 190 HP enemies, like it's not a big deal that your tank dies, you just need the tank for Seraph. So if you can get endless units, like huge thumbs up, that upgrade is better than normal. Like endless Titan Sentry in particular really stands out as just being an absolute winner. Number two, if you can play on multiple floors for this fight, do so. A lot of times as you get better on Covenant 25, you try to play single floor runs as much as possible because you can focus all of your scaling and efforts on protecting one floor. And things like uh, units that get damage or rage on kills or incant creatures tend to profit the most when you can do this. But in this fight, melee weakness is a huge problem. If you just have one floor with stuff that matters, Seraph is gonna come along and spam this floor with melee weakness all of the time. But if you have two floors, Seraph divides his efforts between these floors, and that makes a really big deal that your primary floor isn't just getting melee weakness every single turn. So these are the two most generic pieces of advice I have for you before we dive into specifics. Hellhorn is often looking to use armor to protect its units, and that's one of the primary forms of survival that Hellhorn offers. The issue is that all of the armor cards suck, specifically for this fight when melee weakness is thrown into the mix. So let's consider wave two, for example. Wave two of this fight represents 60 damage from the shade wings alone, and Seraph's melee weakness and Seraph's hit is also a big deal. That means that there's so much incoming damage. Your fortifies, and even your alloys of the ancient, don't really look all that good. So you need unfair armor scaling if you're looking to win this fight that way. And there's only two cards that can unfairly scale that much armor, at least on their own. We're not going to count, like, Kindle into Spike of the Hellhorn sorts of things here. So number one is Transcendent. If you have a handful of Welder Helpers, or you're getting Welder Helpers from Shardtail Queen, Transcendent can, like, 
very, very easily create hundreds of armor just by itself. And if you have multiple Transcendents, or you have an Endless Transcendent, or you can reform Transcendent, you get into a lot of situations where you can outscale Seraph very, very easily. Notably, the imp based strategies often have trouble with the rally aspect of Seraph, and Seraph tends to get stronger rather quickly. But if the creature that you're rallying is Transcendent, like, you're probably going to be okay. The creature you're rallying is Queen's Impling. Good luck. Reinforce is another card that can outscale Seraph. The issue with Reinforce is that you either need to remove Consume from it, or you need a large armor base to start with in order to make this good. If most of your armor is deteriorating every turn just due to enemy attacks and you don't build up a good base, Reinforce is just an expensive card that doesn't really have any text, and that's not okay. So while Reinforce can be good in this fight, you do have to work for it, and you do need to have a lot of armor production in order to make that work. So it kind of sucks, but if you're playing Hellhorned, you tend to rely on your other faction to find you things to win this fight. Because it's largely a rare, it's largely Transcendent that is strong enough to carry this faction by itself in this fight. So just really look for this card. And if you can get this plus some things that synergize with it, like Welder Helpers or Imp in a Box or something of that nature, you can do some pretty broken things. If you're playing a Shardtail Queen run, you probably don't need to do anything to make this card broken. It will just be broken. But you have other issues in that fight, and that's like the rally. Moving on to Awoken. Your Awoken strategy needs to change a little bit from normal. So oftentimes the, 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 the herp-derp easy way to win with Awoken is back, restores, have a billion regen, and just survive through Seraph. But the burst damage that this fight represents and the melee weakness often means that it's very difficult to stack up regen quickly enough to live through initial waves. That means that burst healing is better than normal in this fight. So, unleash the Wildwood. Focus Growth and Awake represent a lot of burst healing, and those cards are much better than normal in this fight because they make up for some of the damage that you're taking during the waves. Awoken does have multiple ways to mitigate the damage taken during waves. Spikes, for example, make the Shade Wings hit once instead of twice. Quick means that a lot of the units are not going to hit you at all. And that's pretty strong. So those are some things to keep in mind. If you are going to go a regen-based route, I really recommend that you go hard for Bloating Fungus. If you have 20 regen stacks, that's usually the amount where you're just laughing at the damage that enemies are doing during the Seraph fight. If you have 20 regen stacks and the opponents are attacking for 80, your 20 regen doesn't look so great anymore. Floating Fungus means that your regen stacks become much, much more meaningful and actually can keep you alive through waves. Remember those first two easy turns I was talking about at the beginning of this video? You're playing a regen based strategy like that's your time to build up a lot of regen stacks to make sure that you can keep your unit alive your regen stacks might not even be enough on their own and you might need some burst healing as well go back here <clears throat> another thing that awoken can do to make this fight easier is increase the max hp of its tanks Cycle of Life is a card that a lot of people really don't like, but I've grown to appreciate this card a lot more as I've been playing more Awoken runs that have Seraph the Patient. If the max HP of your units is a little bit higher, you're less likely to just get one-shotted in a single turn. And if you have burst damage heal cards, like Awake and Unleash the Wildwood and Focus Growth, then you get a little bit more wiggle room for keeping a unit alive. 
the spikes are also very relevant. In addition to just cycle of life, there's also emblem of the exiles that can increase the max life of frontline units as well. So between the two of these and the various heal cards that Awoken have to offer, you can sort of like wiggle around in terms of survival and do a pretty good job at staying alive. If you don't actually encamp all that much, or if you do something like Silence Seraph, you don't actually need all that many regen stacks to beat this Seraph, because frequently you can keep Seraph's damage output under what it might be for a different Seraph. Um, I guess that kind of transitions into Stygian, huh? Yeah, let's just go ahead and go there then. So, Silence, and specifically Unnamed Tome, is one of the easiest ways to just go and win the fight almost instantly. If you silence a Seraph on turn 1 before you've done anything else, and this is just a Seraph that's attacking for 20 rather than, you know, maybe 40 more realistically in a lot of fights, you have halved the damage output of this boss and made this boss a lot less scary. Now, do you still have, like, melee weakness and such to worry about? Yes. Of course. <coughs> but you've dealt with the hardest part of this boss for sure. So, Unnamed Tome is not the only way that you can silence units. There's also Sigiled Seaweed. Sigiled Seaweed only has a 50% success rate, though. Half of the time, this will silence Seraph. Will I spend gold on this in a run? Absolutely. Unquestionably, if I am fighting Seraph the Patient, I will be buying this. It will be a better use than my gold most of the time. That is just like a 50% chance to make the final fight, the hardest fight, much easier. Now, this is not the only thing that Stygian has to offer, though. It's not just silence. There are two different ways that Stygian can help to keep units alive. Sap and Dazed. I recommend Dazed over Sap. And the reason is because Seraph scales when you cast spells, right? So let's take a look at something like Drain. Drain offers Sap 3, which decreases Seraph's damage output by 6, right? 3 times 2. But Seraph is also gaining damage when you incant. So does the Sap outpace the damage increase? Yes. Yes, it does. Is the sap as effective versus other Seraph variants? Oh no. The other Seraph variants are attacking three times for 10 damage, and the sap there is very noticeable. But this Seraph instead is just mawing you with one giant hit for 30 or 40. And while the sap is noticeable there, it isn't decreasing the damage output quite as quickly. So if you want to sap, doing it in an unfair way tends to be better. So for example, having a lodestone totem or two, and then having founding seal to make incant trigger an additional time tends to be incredibly powerful. And that's generically true, not just in this fight. But in this fight, dazed is better than normal. If you dazed and you keep the enemies from attacking, you are very frequently saving yourself 60 plus damage on your frontline unit in a turn, and that's incredible. There is one issue with Dazed, though, and that's that you're going to accrue melee weakness over time. So, let me show you what I mean. So here's, here's your wonderful, wonderful unit, right? So you get sprayed with melee weakness, and then you Dazed it, so nothing ever attacks you and deals damage to get rid of that melee weakness. That may mean that by the time the boss comes around, Seraph has gone and sprayed you with melee weakness a bunch of times. So the first time Seraph actually comes and hits your frontline unit, you might take a billion damage on it. So that's just something to keep in mind. And so if I'm playing a Frenzied Swarm based strategy, a lot of times I like to have two tanks. So I'll do something like Siren, Siren, Tethys. And so if that first Siren dies relatively quickly, my backup Siren can still take a few hits and allow Tethys to do her thing. The incant-based strategies are interesting versus this Seraph if you don't have 
either silence or founding seal because sometimes it's arguable about whether you're getting stronger faster than Seraph is. And notably, breakpoints matter a lot. So let's say you have 100 HP. If Seraph is attacking for 24, you get five attack cycles. But then you incant one more time, and now Seraph is attacking for 25, and you have lost an entire turn cycle worth of damage. So be very careful with playing incant builds versus this Seraph if you're not doing something really unfair with Foundling Seal or Sap or something like that. Um, a couple weeks ago, I had a run that I recorded where like, I had to win, I had my Red Axe, and I'm like, yeah, I've got this. And then I cast literally one more Restore, and I died. The, the difference was that I hit a breakpoint, and Seraph was killing my, uh, my tank one hit sooner, and uh, I, I lost out on too much damage, and Seraph killed me. It was a devastating loss, um, but I learned an important lesson that day. All right. So for the factions that we've looked at so far, Hellhorn is kind of bad versus this Seraph. Awoken is whatever versus this Seraph. Pigeon's fine. The other two factions are very good against this boss. Let's start with Umbra. All of the cards that I have talked about thus far have been either uncommons or rares. And the difference with Umbra is that Prismal Dust is a common. A common, a card that you have in your starter deck a good portion of the time, is insane versus this fight. Damage shields are exactly the sort of thing that you love to see versus Seraph the Patient because they represent saving just so, so much health. Prismal Dust at Common. Morsel Jeweler can be produced by a lot of cards, and it's very, very nice to, uh, to pick up some of these. And a lot of cards that you're already going to want are going to generate them. Like, this is a card you very frequently pick up. It can generate those. Similarly, Grovel, which makes damage shields, can generate more damage shields via Morsels, and so can Gem Trove. So if you have a holdover gem trove or grovel, you can do so much work at mitigating damage in these fights. Similarly, Crucible Warden becomes an incredible creature in this faction for fighting Seraph the Patient, because with a handful of gorges, it becomes very, very easy to mitigate all of the damage shield, sorry, all of the melee weakness. And this unit is probably never actually taking double damage from anything, as long as you get to eat once to start things off and get the ball rolling. Now, there are other options that are very good in this faction, but some of them are a little bit more situational. And Void Binding is one of the best examples of that. Void Binding does provide damage shields, but it's not just the sort of thing that you can throw into your deck willy-nilly. The Ember Drain is very much a real downside, and so you have to build your run around it. The cool thing about Umbra, though, is that you get so many different ways to be able to adapt to this fight. Like, you can find a Prismal Dust in floors 1 through 3, or even in your starting deck. It's not hard to find anything that produces morsels that can be damage shield morsels, so you on just about any run, some random things like Pact Morsels can give you a few damage shields, even if it's not central to your strategy. Crucible Warden is an amazing banner pickup, and I very, very frequently tend to, like, duplicate Grovel or hold over Grovel because it ends up being one of the best cards. Um, notably, oh no, what's it look like? First Hell Pact. There we go. <clears throat> Notably, the first Hell Pact is incredibly good when you're playing Umbra versus this Seraph, because it adds three to your X values. So your Prismal Dusts that are already good become absolutely insane, especially if you go and remove Consume from them. Uh, like these are very strong, even without doing something broken with a with a Kindle or something like that to really put things over the top. All right. Um, it's really hard to tell whether Umbra or Melting is better against this Seraph. Like, both can do some very, very good things to avoid this Seraph. <clears throat> One of the things that I want to start with talking about Melting is this card right here, Remnant Pact. 
I've already talked about how good Endless is versus Seraph. And this is Endless that doesn't require you to waste a unit upgrade spot on it. And Remnant Pact is very, very good versus this boss. Um, you can apply this to different units, like you can apply it to your tank, and that's good. You can apply it to a tomb unit to jump block, and that's good. You can apply it to Molten Encasement. Um, that's a very easy way to cheese the run. Like, Ard is absolutely great. But in addition to that, you can just throw units under the bus pretty easily to block in this fight uh, when you're playing Melting. <coughs> Excuse me. You don't know this until I tell you now, but this is, a, this is a recording attempt three of this video. I haven't liked how some things have turned out the other times. All right, so Little Fade, for example, is often jumping in front of the boss when you're on the, uh, the Burnout line or the Spikes line. And this is something you can play in the front, and it can get the spell weakness and then die every wave or two, and, and that's great and fine and dandy. And there's all sorts of other things that you can do that with, like Remnant Host, that also might work towards scaling some harvest units or something like that. Another non-traditional strategy is, like, just be cool with your units dying. If you're playing a little Fade build, you are going to start with a whole bunch of primitive re primitive molds which reform your units. So if you can be on a burnout-based strategy relatively easily, like you can just keep bringing back the units that die, and that's not the end of the world. So on Little Fade's Firelight Path, for example, it's not all that big of a deal if some of your units die. You can get them back. Stealth is amazing at beating this boss. Like, melee weakness doesn't matter if Seraph can't see you. An endless molten encasement? Or, where are you at? An, an, an engulfed in smoke with holdover will both very much beat this boss with ease. So as you can see here, like you have endless, you have reform, you have stealth, you have more other stealth. Like you have lots of ways to work with this. And then you also have a dazed card. Like I know mortal entrapment, you know, sucks in a lot of ways. But in this fight specifically, Dazed 3 saves so much damage when it comes to the tail end of this fight and the Relentless waves. So while this might not be one of the primary ways that I'm looking to win this fight, I absolutely have taken this card and like thrown two cost reductions on it or one cost reduction and hold over and made it work. I know this card has the word in attuned written on it, so like... You're, you're thinking mentally, they're telling me to put damage on that, um, but I'm finding that's usually not true. I tend to just go and put more... I tend to make this easier to cast or make it more consistent when I'm looking at this Sarah fight. And the Melting also have one other way of attacking this fight, and that's by actually removing the status effects. Both Wickless Recruitment and resin removal can remove the melee weakness that you're looking at in the first place. And that means that you can save a lot of HP. While resin removal with holdover doesn't exactly sound like the most exciting thing in the world, it can actually be very good at keeping your units alive and cleansing that melee weakness. So I hope what you've seen here is that there's a surprising number of ways to counter this Sarah. A lot of the complaints I see are just saying, like, there's nothing I can do. I just got obliterated. I died in one turn. You need to plan for this fight, or that will happen. But if you do plan for this fight, from stealth to removing debuff to silencing Seraph, there's so much you can do to fight back and actually make it so that you steamroll this Seraph. Yes, Hellhorned is not great at this fight. Like, okay, sure, like, let's accept that and move on. You always get paired with something else. And even if you get paired with Awoken, which might be one of the weaker combinations versus this Seraph, you have so many different things that you're looking at that at least give you the option to fight back. Okay, um, I hope this all was useful to you all. Have a great rest of the day.